Uh, in his essay, Loving the City, theologian Daniel Strange will, quote, worry that contextualization depowers the gospel or more commonly waters it down. So uh, he says, we don't think there's enough power in the message itself, some people say, so we try to make up for it with clever contextualization. Tim, start with you. Uh, what do you think is the underlying concern and, and what's your evaluation of that, uh, of that concern? And how do we avoid the, if there's any truth in that concern, how do we avoid it? Well, <clears throat> I do. I hope we both get an answer to this. I guess in the uh, traditional white evangelical world, there are younger ministers who seem to think that contextualization means lots of cultural references uh, and lots of, uh, you know, say, commentary on cultural trends and things like Movies that. Movies and novels. And lots of that. And I guess that, um, most of the people who have pushed back to me on contextualization give me, I, give me examples like that. <clears throat> But that's not even what I think about contextualization. So, for example, in a more um, uh, to a um, uh, actually a lot of Latino culture is like this. A lot of Asian cultures like this. It's it's more shame and honor. Uh, it's more um, uh, it's, it's individualistic. Okay, <clears throat> the Anglo culture is very individualistic. Individual freedom means everything. But the, the sin and grace have to be explained differently. Um, in the in the shame and honor traditional culture, the, the, you tend to make an idol out of family. You tend to make an idol out of your blood. You, I, I mean, actually, it's it's very prone to racism of various sorts. It's very prone to cultural pride. Yeah, in the individualistic culture, you make an idol out of the individual freedom. Um, sin and grace sounds different to those two groups of people. You have to you have to you have to make sure they don't misunderstand it in different ways. That takes different illustrations. It takes different. Um, <clears throat> different arguments. Uh, I don't know. I cannot say that contextualization does, 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 does not mean simply uh, quoting the books and the movies that the people are watching. It really means the way in which I try to convict people of sin and the way in which I connect to their aspirations are different because every culture is different. So uh, to me, contextualization affects everything. Now, in a multicultural situation like a big city, it really gets very tricky because you actually know that out there you have people, especially a multi-generational non-Western church where the, the, the older generation is much less Western and the younger generation is more Western. And then I don't know how a, a lot of my brothers and these other churches, I don't know how they do it because it's very, very difficult. In the same sermon switching three or four Well, times. I don't know, but I can tell you it's certainly a lot more than cultural references, so I don't know how you, you uh, have to contextualize. Uh. Yeah, I, I think that is really uh, speaking to culture. It, it confronts all the idols. Yeah. And, and, and so it confronts the idols of not just my generation, but my culture. So those could, those could be idols of shame. Idols of, of you know blatant narcissism and egocentrism, but also kind of idols of, of modernity, and idols of, of 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 late modernity or post modernity, depending on who's writing on you know. Often when I often hear preachers like like Tim and others in in, the, in that circle of, of men and women I respect, you know I I often see that that there's a lot of reference to like the the thinkers and the thought leaders are. are the C.S. Lewis in there and, 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 and some of the great thinkers of, of previous generations, but the gospel challenged them too and some of their uh, assumptions. And so I think that the danger that uh, Strange is representing, I think, is collapsing the gospel with the idols of our generation or our culture. And that, that exists for all of us. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of, you know, you're, you're in the apology. You know, I'm concerned that a, a lot of Christian gospel apologetics is really apologetics of modernity that lack like a real confrontation and debunking of the idols of modernity and, and, and the Enlightenment, you know. And, and so me, who comes from, from the, the, the two-thirds world, uh, and, and I saw the, the deleterious effects of the Enlightenment and how it was collapsed into gospel messages, I'm concerned modern apologetics in a way that doesn't take seriously that what we're not contextualizing. We're not, it's not contextualization. It is just a blind allegiance that does not allow for the gospel to confront the idols of that generation. And the 
my concern. In terms of proclamation and preaching, uh, Tim is right. Look, you know, I'm talking about um, sin, right? And, and I'm talking about sin in a culture where, where shame is the sin and, 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 un and I'm beyond the grace. Not, it's not the same as a generation where the sin is, I don't need grace, I'm, I'm self-sufficient, I'm fine, I'm, right? And so they're both sitting in the pew, <laughs> wow. and, and, right? and so, so many uh, of preaching from, from, from this circle that, that I often speak to is, is an Augustinian understanding of sin, which is the sin of pride, and that, mm. that, that pride is the only sin. But Big enough to account for both. That's right. Is when, when we're, we're disconnected from the grace of God, doesn't just come through pride, but there's this kind of unselfworthiness that I think much of the preaching and teaching um, in, in modern white evangelical America is. And if, if, it, if it is true that the future of evangelicalism in America uh, is, is multi ethnic, you know, we're, ta we're still talking black and white, and our kids are watching high definition television, we really need to develop a gospel-centered understanding of homo theology and sin. What I, I hear you guys saying is actually contextualization isn't a beachhead for capitulation. It's actually mm -hmm. what we need to call people to repentance intelligently. You confront first in contextualization. You actually do surprise them. You come around the back and you say, actually, what you're looking for, it's still here. It's in Jesus. So you actually, at a certain point, do have to come back and and their deepest aspirations and their best things. But uh, I do think it actually starts with the confrontation. And I, I do think there are ways of, if you define sin like Augustine in terms of disordered loves, uh, then that keeps you from uh, the, the person who says, I'm just beyond all shame. Uh, you can sort of, you know, beyond being, being helped, and the person who says everything's fine. I've actually fi found that the, that the, uh, the guiltless supposedly Fine. If you talk to them about disordered loves, they recognize themselves. They start to get convicted about that. And if you talk to the uh, other uh, the person who, again, is focused on the fact I broke a law, if you show about the heart, and you could never, you couldn't be saved if you had kept that law, that that particular law, because you'd be guilty in some other way. I do think there is a way eventually to preach like that, in which both those people are starting to biblical idea of sin that's drawing them closer to the gospel. It, it is, it's not easy, but it's, um, it's a great challenge. That's one of the reasons I like urban ministry.